every Saturday, I've always walked past this wonderful Victorian house and it always captured my imagination because I love its architectural details. Victorian properties are such a joy to look at. But luckily, I noticed that there was a free art exhibit which gave me a chance to have a nosy about the Victorian house and have a look. I truly felt like Alice in Wonderland because I'm not particularly a huge fan of art museums or art installations, but I must say I did enjoy this in combination with looking at the architectural features such as this beautiful ceiling roses that you can only ever find in these Victorian houses. I was just enchanted. The house had a grand staircase with an incredible stained glass window. It was built in 1881 for a wealthy wool merchant and so it was meant to be the best that the time could offer. The artist has created this installation to make people think about the fourth dimension or spatial dimensions. Her drawings were very mathematically inclined, which I found quite interesting. I wasn't expecting to be interested in the artwork as it was just a chance for me to walk around an old Victorian house, something that I loved to do. But I must say that the serendipity of meeting and enjoying this artistical endeavor was something that I appreciated and I definitely think that going forward I need to be more open-minded to things that might present themselves at my feet. So this room that I'm in right now that you are seeing was their chapel and it had these incredibly high ceilings and these beautiful vaulted windows and had all this light streaming in. At the top of the attic, there was this interesting peek into another dimension. But the best part was there was a wardrobe, very reminiscent of Narnia. And you walked through the wardrobe into what was felt like an infinite dimension is the best way that I could describe it. They didn't tell you what to expect in this room, which added to the experience. After I collected my kids from the activity that we were walking to, I took them to this exhibit and they also really enjoyed the magical mirrored room. Dinner Saturday night was a very simple chili con carne with some rice, tortilla chips and carrots. Perfect for a cold, wintry day. Sunday early morning started with me preparing the oxtail for the oxtail stew. So with oxtail, I like to sear and to brown the oxtail. And for this, I will use butter ghee, which is an oil, a fat that is used a lot in Asian cooking because it has a very high smoke point, which means that you can sear your food without getting all of that burnt smell. So I'll use my cast iron skillet, which is perfect for doing um, very high heat searing because I don't want to cook the oxtail. I just want to brown it before I move it into the slow cooker, which is where it's going to be cooking throughout the day. So as you can see over there, it is very, very hot and it makes this lovely sound when you put the oxtail on there. And that is just going to seal in the juicy flavorness. And it means that whilst the meat is going to fall away from the bone once it's cooked, it's not just going to become shreddy like you get with pulled pork. So I do take the extra time to do this. You can if you wanted to 
just stick it into the slow cooker but I find that the fat doesn't render quite as beautifully as it does when you sear it with some heat and at this point even though it was very early in the morning gosh it smelled so good because it smells like you're frying a steak and it just got me so hungry <laughs> to get it nicely golden brown like you can see on here and I like to seal all sides of the oxtail so if I'm out of time I will just do the top and the bottom but in this case I did the sides and then there we have the slow cooker um, dish so to speak and what I'll do is I will put all of the uh, seared oxtail into the bottom of the slow cooker by this point i've had the slow cooker on for about 30 minutes just to get it warm and hot and i find that that makes it a little bit more efficient so that it doesn't spend time trying to warm up the ceramic of the dish before the heat then arrives to the meat itself so that's a little tip there is if you're using a slow cooker start it going at least 30 minutes before you actually have to use the ceramic dish so that you don't experience any thermal loss now in order to get a really great beefy flavor i love to keep things simple with the oxtail so i'll just use salt some oxo cubes and a little bit of onion powder because to me there is nothing more superior than beef and onion flavor and so I do like to keep it simple like that so I start off by sprinkling the salt in this case I just used one teaspoon of salt less if you so prefer and then I'll mix in the two oxo cubes with one teaspoon of the onion powder and just blend that with some boiling water and I do advise to keep to use very hot or boiling water if you're dealing with a slow cooker otherwise it increases the cooking time I then pour that mix just until I've barely covered the oxtail and on that pan there's going to be loads of flavor at the bottom of that pan I'm just going to add some frozen onions to this now I can do this because this is a cast iron skillet however if you have something that is an anodized steel you need to check your instructions because some of the teflon coated non-stick cookware cannot handle the thermal shock of having something very cold going on to something very hot so I will then add a little bit of that oxo cube water to deglaze the pan and get all of that delicious flavoring and then I'll add these uh, caramelized onions over on top of the oxtail and then that's it I'm going to cover it over and I'm going to leave it in the slow cooker in my case I'm cooking it on high and it will go for about four to five hours on high we'll head off to church now wherein I was feeling very very elegant because I finally finished the skirt that I had been working on and I got to wear it out today and I had finished it the previous night I was sewing by I was sewing the snap fasteners by the fire the previous night it was a cold and blustery day with a little bit of rain but not enough for it not to be possible to do some work in the garden and there was some work that needed to get done in the garden 
Now, I love gardening, and part of the reason is how I've learned a lot of deep, meaningful life lessons from gardening, such as pruning. One of the things about pruning is that when I'm pruning the plant, I'm helping the plant send valuable nutrients to the healthy parts of itself. And because the dead or the dying parts are no longer there, the plant isn't wasting valuable resources trying to resurrect them. The metaphor here is that as you shift your focus onto a new adventure, a new path, a new goal for yourself, you are focusing all of your resources on that new path and not still keeping your attention on the past or on an old path that no longer serves you. That splitting of your focus keeps you straddling the old and the new paths with no forward movement on either path. As you set your sights on a new direction, all of your available resources need to move in that same direction. The same as when I trim away all the dying parts of the trees, I forced the trees to only focus on what was left, the healthy parts of themselves. Just like people, a tree only has so much energy to blossom, bear fruit, make new branches, heal cuts, fight disease, and manage stress. The more places it needs to spread those finite resources, the smaller and less abundant its fruit. In fact, some trees get so leggy their fruit is nothing more than seeds. If you want big, juicy, tasty fruit, you must limit the number of places those resources need to go. By pruning, you select the strongest branches and cut away the weaker ones. For example, if the tree has 10 branches and you pruned 4, the remaining 6 would get all the nutrients and sunlight, thus producing bigger, tastier fruit. And the same is true in life. Pruning is life. Our li your life is a tree. Each branch is an interest, activity, and relationship. Each one requires energy to bear fruit. Some branches may be dying or diseased, some are at cross purposes, others are broken beyond repair. Airflow and spaciousness between them is essential. When you have an overfull life or feel overwhelmed a lot of the time, it's usually a sign that you have too many branches. Your energy is too diffuse to sustain everything. If you prune back things that are non-essential, you provide more vigor to the activity branches that remain. Overwhelm decreases and happiness grows by pruning. It's 100%. Now that the troops were appropriately fed, it was time to move on to dinner. I'd already prepped the cauliflower that I was going to steam, and we were going to have some boiled kale, some curly kale, 
and some mashed potato to go with the oxtail stew. Dessert is going to be a sticky toffee pudding that we get from Costco and this stuff is really good stuff so it's two packs. like that and then you just have to bake it. What you do is take off the lid like that like so. What we have now smells so good. It's just falling off the bone, so I'm very gentle with it. So now I have to let it rest for a little bit so that I can come back and skim, remove all of the fat off of this. I'm telling you, this stuff is so delicious, guys. The meat is just falling off the bone. Okay. After I've let it rest for about 10 minutes, um, after having turned off the slow cooker, I'm able to get the fat off of the top. So I used I used a, just a, a normal serving spoon and I basically go around scooping off as much of the fat as I can at the top. And even though I'll get some of the sauce underneath, it's mostly the fat that I will be getting off. I do this because my children don't particularly like the fat. I'm perfectly fine with it and in fact I actually keep the fat and I use it for cooking other things uh, for myself. So if you wanted to take it a step further and absolutely get rid of any bits of fat in there, you could use a paper towel. It will cost you two paper towels in fact that you have to wrap and you just sort of gently dab over the top and what the paper towel does is it actually absorbs the oil, a lot of the oil first before it gets onto the sauce and as you can see there most of the oil is completely done after i've used these two steps the oxtail does produce a lot of oil fat so this is a great way of removing it the next thing that i do is to thicken the sauce using corn flour now this is entirely optional if you like your sauce a little bit on the runny side it will still work just as well so I tend to mix um, just about two tablespoons for this size of the slow cooker. It's two tablespoons of cornstarch with just a little bit of water. And I'll add that in and stir it gently. And then I'll turn the slow cooker back on for another 10 minutes or so just for it to cook the corn flour so that you don't get that floury taste. But this is just going to taste so delicious. It smells so good because it just smells of the pure beefiness of oxtail. This is the fat that I collected. I will keep it and I'll use it for frying bacon or for frying eggs. And they'll have that delicious beefy flavor to them. When it came time to serving, it came went with the mashed potatoes, the steamed cauliflower and the boiled kale. And it was delicious. The meat was just falling off the bone. It had this wonderful umami taste. And you could really get the beef flavor because we didn't add too much other stuff to it. And I love it. This is one of my favorites, oxtail stew. Mm. And perfect for a really cold, blustery, rainy winter's day.
after dinner and dessert had been had and we'd reset the kitchen, it was time to do a job that I had been putting off for over a week and that was cleaning the cutlery set that we won at auction recently. It was a mighty job that I had been procrastinating but it had to get done and so on with it we started. After having read up on how to look after electroplated stainless steel, of which that's the material that this set is made of, the game plan was to remove each of the groups of items, group by group, wash them in a solution of hot water with some liquid detergent, and we needed to use a lot of towels and the advice was to dry them and polish them pretty much straight away. Once we got the water ready for them, we soaked them very briefly because also the care advice was not to soak them for a long time in water as that could create corrosive effects. Another thing that I actually realized in practice was that when you're using a scouring pad, it's a really bad idea to use the scouring side of it. So if you've got those ones that have a sponge and the scourer, it actually leaves marks, scratch marks on there, which is not good. But luckily I realized it after doing only one of the serving spoons and we didn't make that same mistake again. I didn't want to put these in the dishwasher because even though I love the dishwasher as an incredible labor saving device in this modern world, generally if I love something, I tend not to put it into the dishwasher because I find that over time, for some reason or the other, the items will sort of lose their luster and so in that regards i made the decision that these ones would not be put in the dishwasher and even going forward when we do use them which we plan on using them daily they will get washed by hand The felt lined interior of the cutlery box was quite challenging to clean because the fabric hangs on to any bits and bobs so I had to bring out the vacuum cleaner and use the suction power to suck up the little bits and bobs. I then finished that off by using a damp cloth to get into the corners and give it a wipe down. I then grabbed my hair dryer to then dry the surface off the felt in order to get it quite clean. And I think afterwards it looked really quite good and clean. Unfortunately, I did make marks on the felt tip with being a bit too aggressive, but it was better to get it clean rather than not. And by this point, the, silk, the stainless steel was just looking so beautiful and shiny and glinty. And honestly, there's something magical about that. I just, I, I get it now. I get why. Uh, back in the day, this was an important thing to do, polishing the silver, so to speak.
finally, after about an hour and a half, we were done thanks to the help of my daughters. But at least the job is now completed. One final thing was to add some silicone sachets, you know, the ones that absorb moisture to the trays, to the cutlery box itself, because it did have a slightly musty smell. And I was worried about some of the dampness from when I used a damp cloth to wipe it down, even though I'd used a hairdryer. So just to be on the safe side, I put in some of these silicone sachets in there and that will help to keep everything nice and dry and to keep the stainless steel from getting corroded over time. That's all I have for today, lovelies. Thank you so much for watching and for coming to visit with us. Until I see you next time, I wish you blue skies, health and happiness. <music>